Okay, so here we're going to just continue on with how, uh, as I ended up last class, um, you want to, whoops, that's wrong. Why is that there? I'm not here. This is it. Okay. Yeah, where we ended up <laughs> last class is, um, well, let me just go to this previous slide here. Oh, does this work? No, it doesn't work because I'm on here. I'm thinking that I'm actually, there we go. Yeah, the, this sort of the magical view, ancient, the view of reality in the ancient world that had been developed up to this point and then further fleshed out in what's often referred to as the hermetic tradition, that this develops what's often called the esoteric. It's sort of foundational to what's known as the esoteric tradition in the West. Um, that is sort of a different orientation to reality. All right, it's a different orientation to reality than what is going to become the, the view of reality that we find developed in Christianity as it gets established as a religion. And therefore, it's sort of the main established religion in the West, right? This is uh, the magical esoteric view is an alternative to that. And then later with the rise of the enlightenment and secular humanism and the rise of rationalism and all that, uh, then this is going to be then sort of the third uh, uh, orientation to reality that's going to develop. Whereas this esoteric one is what goes underground here during this time, okay? And it's, going to what, it's what, what's going to be feeding and be drawn from in the 1960s when we have the whole hippie culture, uh, you know, movement kicking off in the counterculture of the 60s, all right? They're going to draw from this esoteric, magical tradition, in a sense. That's what's going to get revived, revitalized, right? So anyway, so it's gone underground. When Christianity gets established as a religion, and a lot of this gets forgotten and lost, kind of percolates a bit underground, but it's largely marginalized and pretty much abandoned to a large degree. So what happens next? I know it's, I think, is we have a revival of this, all right? So often, you know, we, again, the word occult means hidden, secret, uh, is, is addressing that deeper level of reality, right? That's hidden and not obvious, um, and therefore it being hidden and on the inside, it's, it's sort of hidden on the inside, is often been esoteric. That's what the root meaning of esoteric is. It's that which is inner, uh, the inner secret hidden teachings, uh, the inner hidden secret understanding of reality, <laughs> okay? It's sort of what the words all refer to. So we find a revival happening during the Renaissance, all right, within, by various Christian thinkers. Oh, this does work this way. Okay, great. And so this occult revival, and I'm going to go into present now, and uh, just so you yeah, can see things better. Um, there's going to be a number of figures involved here, all right, just to give you a little bit of an introduction. Uh, Marsilio Ficino, he'll be doing a lot of the translating and publishing of some important works that had been forgotten and lost. And then Giovanni, as we'll see here, he writes a manifesto. Uh, Johann Reuschlin and uh, Johannes Trithemius will talk about each of these a little bit here coming up. Okay, so here is Marsilio Ficini, Ficino. And, I don't know, hopefully you can see uh, his dates there, right? Because my head, I have a bar there about uh, screen sharing. Anyway, uh, what happens here? So this is in the you know 1400s, and Islam has arisen, and Islam has conquered the whole of the Middle East, gotten into Spain, over into India. You know, it's a covering a huge amount of uh, territory Islam has, and has been always been wanting to get into Europe beyond Spain. You know, trying to get into Vienna and whatnot. And so what happens here is in uh, in the mid 1400s, is when uh, the Muslims conquer uh, what today is called Istanbul, but used to be called Constantinople. And the city of Constantinople, which is today Istanbul in Turkey, it was the center for Christianity in competition with Rome. Okay, and it represents the uh, headship of the Eastern Orthodox tradition in Christianity. And Rome, the Roman Catholic Church with the Pope being the head of the church there. But Constantinople was a very important Christian center and city at this time. And it had a huge library and uh, a lot of uh, valuables there. And so the Muslims end up capturing 
uh, the city of Constantinople and rename it, name it Istanbul. And so a lot got destroyed. But just before this happened, uh, Cosimo de' Medici, um, he managed to save a lot of manuscripts and have them brought over into Europe. Okay, here specifically into Italy, and uh, where he had then uh, Ficino translate a lot of this material and saved a lot of um, uh, texts that otherwise would have been gone. And so, you know, it was really interesting to watch is um, on Netflix, Netflix, they have the Medici series uh, based on history, and they also have on Netflix the um, overtaking the Ottoman conquering is uh, Constantinople. So those are interesting things to watch on Netflix because you kind of see the real history there in these films. So anyways, <clears throat> uh, Ficino, he was a Catholic priest, philosopher, magician, healer. And this is the thing at this time, there, you know, again, a lot of this stuff had been lost and forgotten. So there hadn't been this kind of demonization of it. Um, yes, that had existed back in the Greco-Roman world. And yes, there was some sus thinking that this is all just outdated suspicion, some things about magic. But there also is a whole nother wing here of those who held that this is a, some of this is basically a type of what they would call natural magic. Um, that there wasn't this kind of uh, hostility and condemnation of what would be called magic. It was seen as working with the energies in the universe, working with sound frequencies, that, that this was a way of doing natural healing. It was seen as a type of science, really, for a lot of these people. And this is where he was coming from, along with many others at this time. Uh, they felt that they could work with things like astrology, uh, energy, sound vibrations, right? All these things to bring about healing uh, and whatnot. And they called it natural magic. And they felt that this in, in no way conflicted with their Christian faith, all right? And this is where he was at. So he translates a lot of works. I think I have another slide of his. No, I don't. Okay. Uh, he translates a lot of the works of Plato and uh, some of the Neoplatonists, as well as aspect. Well, yeah, I have that there. Translate the works of Plato and the Corpus Hermeticum, these Hermetic texts. Okay. So with these being translated, then um, people had access to these ideas and were fascinated by them. Okay, let me just move my self here. And here the next figure here who was a student and friend of Ficino is Giovanni Pico della Mirandola. Uh, and there are his dates. He died in 1494. And he began the process. Okay, so Ficino just translated the works. What here he does, Giovanni, he merges Hermetic traditions with the Bible. And he also studied Jewish Kabbalah and felt that there could be a synthesis synth syncretic kind of integration of these things. He uh, wrote what's often called the Manifesto of the Renaissance uh, based on Hermetic philosophy. But, you know, I have to say, it's not just Hermetic philosophy, it's also biblical, some of these things. It's an essay that was called The Oration on the Dignity of Man. And he ended up being imprisoned for a while as a heretic. But just let, let me read you a passage from... Now, how does... Okay. There we go. This is a quote from the uh, Oration on the Dignity of Man. It goes like this here. Uh, you know, I wish I, just, I guess I can't get rid of my picture of me, can I? Maybe I should and not have that there. I don't know. Adam, this is uh, how he sees the biblical um, passage of based on Genesis, the book of Genesis and the creation of humanity. And, uh, and so he's basically saying that this is what God desires. This is the voice of God speaking to the human race. Adam being the first human created in the name of the first man. Adam literally meant man in Hebrew. Okay. And it goes like this, Adam, we give you no fixed place to live, no form that is peculiar to you, nor a function that is yours alone, i.e. the human being is not totally confined to any one place, any one particular form, as animals are. You know, animals can only do certain things. They can only live, you know, a, a, a crocodile can only live in the water and a little bit on land, uh, or birds can only fly in the sky. They're limited. They're fixed in terms of where they can live and what they can do. They're limited. But for humans, there is no limitation. 
according to your desires and judgment, you can have and possess whatever place you want to live and whatever form you want to take, whatever functions you yourself choose. See, this is the inherent greatness and dignity given to the human being is the possibility, infinite possibility. All other things in creation have a limited and fixed nature prescribed to them, and they are bounded by laws. But you, oh dear human being, you have no limit. You have no bound. You can choose for yourself the limits and bounds of your nature. Right? It's like, wow. Herein lies the greatness of the human being made in the image and likeness of God. That there is this potentiality for divinity within the human being. This is what sets them apart. Right? And again, this is based on the biblical text of these ideas. So anyways, it goes on. We have placed you at the center of the world so that you can then survey everything in the world. You can see and take it all in. Way more than what an animal can. An animal can't. They're very limited in what they can take in of reality and life, but not so for the human being. Okay? We have made you neither of heavenly nor earthly stuff, neither mortal nor immortal. Remember that passage I read from the Gnostics, okay, that what makes the human being greater than even the angels and the gods is that the human being is not just limited to the heavens. A human being can be here on earth, take in physicality, but also can take in the heavenly and the spiritual. Therein lies the greatness uh, and the amazing potential of the human being. It's a compass, all worlds, physical and spiritual, earthly and heavenly. Okay, so there isn't that limitation. We experience mortality, all right, physical birth and death, but yet at our soul, we're also eternal and immortal. So we have this duality about us, right? It's unique. So, anyways, to continue. So then we've made you like all this so that with free choice, freedom of choice, freedom to create, and dignity, dignity, you may fashion yourself into whatever way you choose. Right? To you is granted the power of degrading yourself into the lower forms of life. Herein lies, because of our intelligence and our, our potential, our creative potential, we can become the most evil beings on this planet, far worse than animals, even lower than animals in terms of the evil we can create because of our intelligence. Hmm? So we have the power of degrading ourselves into a lower form of life to even be lower than the beasts, I would say. And to you is also, though, granted the power contained within your intellect and judgment. Huh? We need to use this and awaken it and activate it to be reborn into higher forms. Indeed, divinity. Right? Herein lies the dignity, the greatness of what it means to be a human being. Right? And, uh, and that is it's a part of the hermetic tradition, but it's also, and I, I want to emphasize this, is very much there in Genesis and in the biblical tradition. Okay, it is. So anyways, yeah, so th that's him. He kind of fleshes some of these things out. So influenced by Pico, we have Johann Reuschlin. Okay, again, just a little bit later in date. You know, again, they're kind of um, uh, peers in ways, but uh, just going a little bit further in time. He was a humanist philosopher, and he wrote the first book on the Kabbalah, which is as a non-Jew. So the Kabbalah is Jewish mysticism. <laughs> it's huge. It's huge. It's very complex and deep, deep stuff, all right? And uh, so anyways, it's so interesting, though, as Christians, these guys all are, uh, they're fascinated with these other ways of thinking and orientation that largely had been, you know, shelved, lost, lost and forgotten. Okay. So he integrates the Jewish Kabbalah with uh, the teachings of Pythagoras, right? And uh, felt that Jewish Kabbalah could provide a vision for integrating faith and science. Okay, faith and science. And this is where, if you've seen that video yet by Dean Radden, uh, he wrote the book Real Magic, and um, in the beginning, you know, in, in that video, he says that really, in the beginning, you had magic was sort of the umbrella that contained within it both religion and science, right? And, and this is the vision that they had here. It's is like it was a more holistic, integrated, more comprehensive vision that magic can contain both religion and science and, and comprehends it all. 
instead of this kind of what later develops into the dismissal of both magic first <laughs> and then religion as well and it's just like science only knows what the truth is all right and that's kind of where our society tends to be in our secular society but anyway that's not how it was so he felt the Jewish Kabbalah could provide a vision for integrating faith and science. And he wanted to see Hebrew and Jewish works taught at the university, which caused him problems. And this is where he was like, ah, oh, you're boarding. Up. Well, in one's not really heresy directly, but it was just taboo. <clears throat> because again, <clears throat> the universities were predominantly Christian institutions at this time in history, right? And, uh, and so there would be tension there about, over this factor. Okay. And uh, just again, I'm just highlighting some of the names at this time period who were influential in cultivating and spreading this kind of orientation. <laughs> the next is Johannes Trithymius. <laughs> again, a little bit later, he died 1516. He was a Benedictine abbot, which meant, you know, he was responsible for overseeing a Benedictine monastery. And so he's really up there as far as that goes in terms of influence and education and you know, power, so to speak, in terms of running a Benedictine monastery. And he grew the library there they had to over 2,000 volumes on a lot of this esoteric stuff and taught that magic indeed can be used as a Christian by Christians to empower the soul, okay? It empowers the soul by God. Like it, it was something that was so demonized in order to reach heaven, uh, to, again, it has spiritual value and purpose. And his students ended up being Paracelsus and Cornelius Agrippa, uh, as we'll see here in a bit. Agrippa wrote a very famous three volume work called Occult Philosophy, which became foundational to Western magic. Right? But he was originally a student of Trithinius, this Benedictine abbot. Then we have Paracelsus. Oh, let me see. And he's, there's here. Well, let me just go back then. I, so here's a little Agrippa again. His dates a little bit later, 1535 is when he died. And also appreciated the Jewish mystical tradition, the Kabbalah. Uh, defended a woman charged with witchcraft because this is now starting the whole witch trials start happening. Uh, the Inquisition starts going off here now. Uh, he himself was accused of being a heretic. And so this is where now tension starts brewing and things going on. He was a scholar, lecturer, soldier, knight, and healer. And also wrote a book on the superior intelligence of women. Okay, but he's mostly known for his occult philosophy. Very famous for that in occult circles. Then we have Paracelsus, that I mentioned, uh, again, a little bit later, 1541. And he was a traveling medical doctor. And he sought to gain the wisdom of herbalists, uh, you know, women who, who, who basically, you know, any, any, anyone, this isn't always women, uh, but anyone who kind of worked more with natural remedies and the old ways, sort of, if you want to call them old pagan ways of bringing healing through the use of herbal medicines and whatnot. Okay. And, um, and so he very much challenged uh, the rise of sort of modern science, so to speak, and modern medicine was just beginning at this time. And he resented how in academia at that time, everything was in Latin. Uh, all, the class, all the classes were taught in Latin. Latin was the language of the intellectuals, of the educated. And he held that it should be the language of the people. And one day he did an outrageous thing. He took a lot of books from the library in terms of the new medical approach to healing and health that he held was just nonsense and had them all burnt. He said, we need to learn from the people themselves through herbs and, and, and their traditions, more natural means of healing and speak the language of the people and teach in the language of the people. So he was very much resented uh, and was a rebel to the establishment at that time and was resented by those who were in power and influence, especially at the university. So he held that true knowledge and understanding for healing, and even in terms of the sciences, it, you know, it just didn't come from being locked up in a university and hearing other people talk. He held you had to be connected with nature. And it was a very much a more of a spiritual process of being in attunement with nature, and that if you really had the right spiritual approach, it's almost like nature would speak to you and lead you and guide you into understanding how things worked, right? Uh, that was like, as, as it says here, a, a conscious living force in nature, that she would reveal her secrets to those who really had an open soul. 
And what was interesting too at this time is he was one of the first to emphasize the psychological um, role, the, the role of the psyche in terms of health and sickness. And that, you know, what you believe and what you think, you know, today we call it the placebo effect, <laughs> you know, that if you believe that this is the magic pill that's going to cure me, it's, and, and it's really just sugar, but it's your faith that heals you. And he recognized that your belief is key here in terms of, you know, your state of well-being and your health. And so he held that imagination and the power of belief right, is very, very important. And that prayer and faith play a critical role as well in terms of healing and health. And unfortunately, what happened is um, he had a lot of enemies. And one day he was just found dead in a pub, uh, in a tavern. And uh, uh, he was just found dead. Uh, so somebody did something to him. Um, yeah, and that's how he ended his life. Then we have John Dee, who is quite famous. And again, a bit later, died 1608 to 9. Uh, esteemed to be one of the most learned men of his time. He also was into hermetic philosophy and magic, but also a scientist and astrologer and very integrated all very much and deeply so with his Christian faith. He was most well known for being an advisor to Queen Elizabeth at this time. Okay. And that she, through astrology, he gave her advice with respect to accessing the crown. I forget now the details of how that went, but based on astrological assessment, he gave her advice based on astrology and it came true and it was, it all worked. And so she was so impressed with him based on that. That's why she then uh, had him be her advisor. Well, he started to connect uh, as he explored the hermetic magical tradition. He got hooked up with this guy named Edward Kelly, who had the ability to kind of go into a bit of a trance. And he'd go into a trance and would be able to then look at a crystal ball. And that's a practice known as scrying, is looking into shiny objects. I think we mentioned that way back in the beginning, right, as a technique in divination but looking like in a crystal ball and he would be able to get these revelations these messages coming to him that he believed were coming from the angels and in another language they called Enochian okay uh, Enochian language and then from that that then became the basis that got developed into what different circles called Enochian magic uh, working and calling upon the angels to create various results <laughs> through magical ritual. And this then goes into different occult societies like the Rosicrucians, the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, and uh, Alistair Crowley, who started up his own group, uh, OTO, which we'll mention later on, but it played a key role here. Then uh, there was a change in circumstances, and to make a long story short, he got totally destroyed. Uh, his whole place got burned down, all his books destroyed, everything was destroyed, and he was condemned as a heretic in the end. And it was a pretty sad state uh, story for him there, how it ended. But he was very influential at that time, though, before things turned negative for him. So, so far at this point here, uh, basically, uh, people would have made here a distinction between three types of magic. That, yes, indeed, there's a dark magic, a black magic, where you call upon demonic forces, satanic forces, to gain power, to get desired results. Okay, you call upon demons. Then there was a thing that they called white magic, where you call upon angels and you call upon God. Okay. And so this is what they felt. They could integrate magic with their faith because they're calling upon the assistance of angelic beings or God himself to get the desired results through a ritual. Then there's a thing called natural magic, which is just simply doing magic, working with the forces and energy in nature. Okay, in nature. What a lot of people today would call healing, um, you know, energy healing type of thing. Okay. And so this also is a time when there's increasing uh, fear of black magic and witchcraft that develops during this time. And that's when we start seeing the, the uh, witch trials and persecution of witches and Satanists and all kinds of terrible things happening here. But what happens next is that because of the uh, hostility that develops through magic, because of the inquisition and the witch hunting that starts going on, uh, what ends up happening is that these esoteric teachings now start to get 
passed down within secret societies. So individuals aren't so vocal anymore about it. Uh, you'd have to become a member of a secret so society and you know, mom is the word. You do not say or talk about what you learn, what you're teaching, uh, the things that you believe, the practices that you do. It becomes silence. It, it's guarded and protected in these secret societies in order to avoid any kind of persecution. Okay, this is what happens here. All right. Maybe I should make this brighter. Yeah, I didn't think of that. Okay. Um, so that's what's happened. So, yeah, it's like the Rosicrucians, Freemasons, etc. Right? And uh, so, I should have brought some glass of water. So first of all, just a little bit on the Rosicrucians. This is a, uh, a group that develops in the 1600s. And how it begins is two pamphlets appear in Germany, claiming to be by a fellow named Christian Rosenkreutz. And that's where Rosicrucian gets its name from, Rosenkreutz, okay? Who supposedly lived, you know, 1378 to 1484. And these pamphlets describe his travels in the 1400s in the Mediterranean world, okay, going around throughout the Mediterranean, acquiring wisdom, you know, the secret wisdom of the past, uh, the magical wisdom of the past, right? And he then formed a secret brotherhood where the people involved were committed to a vow of silence for a hundred years. That, they'd, that all these secret teachings he gathered in the Mediterranean world, they were committed to a vow of silence. They wouldn't tell anybody what they were into. Okay. And so these teachings were based on the hermetic, uh, uh, occult, esoteric tradition, all this sort of magical re concepts that we've been looking at here. And, uh, and so, so these pamphlets start to appear. And however, as I said, in uh, the 1600s is when these pamphlets appear. Okay. And so people start developing these lodges called Rosicrucian lodges in the 1600s saying, okay, the hundred year period is over from about you know, 1500 to 1600. That hundred year period is over. We're now going a little bit more public and people are invited or they could be a part of the secret society in terms of these lodges which is just like an organization, okay, where people will hold their secret meetings and gatherings, uh, uh, you know, in the society. So this is what starts happening in the 1600s. Okay. Well, then we also have, though, in Europe, these Masonic guilds, okay? And, you know, Masonic guild is sort of, you could think of it like a union, a union of workers who did all the bricklaying, all the stonework, you know, the stonework for building the cathedrals, uh, stonework for building houses and various buildings. They, they did the stonework, bricks and stones, okay? They're the masons. And they formed uh, like a, 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 union, a type of union that a whole group of them, we always work together and we help each other out. We get this job, we get that job. You know, they would kind of bind together, all right? And so these Masonic guilds, as they were connected as a, almost like a type of union to do these jobs together, right? And they would then have those sort of economic business relational ties with each other. They then uh, started to bring in Rosicrucian teachings, okay, into their circles. And so then they formed Masonic Lodge, as they become known as the Freemasons, All right? Okay, and that I should be, oh, okay, that I should move that, oops, sorry. Ugh. Uh, I meant to try, I always forget when I'm on here. I wanted to move the Rosicrucian order symbol at the bottom there. Um, so anyways, they form these Masonic lodges and they become known as the Freemasons. And basically, they're the blending of Rosicrucian esoteric occult teachings on the one hand with uh, economic business professional kind of ties, you know, where they support each other in business and work together and sort of like a business network, if you like, okay? But beginning just with the Masons, Masonic uh, stone workers, and then it expand into just other kinds of business. So that's sort of what happens. You get the blending of the two, and there when we have the Freemasons, and you would get initiated into different levels and stages. It's held to be secretive. You don't tell people what's, what you believe, what you do. It's all rather secretive, okay? And that's how the Freemasons develop. And so this is how this esoteric tradition gets now channeled into these groups, these secret societies, right, in this time period. 
and uh, and you can see here 1717 is sort of the Grand Lodge of England was established that is sort of the mother <laughs> the hub the center uh, for the Freemasons and then from there it was brought over into America and if you remember that um, and one film video on hermetic influence. You can see the influence on uh, the buildings in Washington, D.C., you know, and, and various features of that. You know, it shows up in a lot of the uh, books and films that they did on, based on Dan Brown's books, uh, Angels and Demons and the Da Vinci Code and all that sort of stuff, okay? And that's where a lot of this hermetic kind of influence gets channeled through and uh, and the Masons here were very influential because a lot of the founding fathers in the US were Masons okay and so you get that influence happening there all right I think yeah that's that's it for this here section all right so that's just to give you a bit of an idea as to how it gets revived uh, goes underground gets revived in the um, Renaissance and how it then ends up uh, getting packaged into these secret societies. Okay, and we'll pick it up from there next session.